and go. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Raj Dave, uh, uh, chairman of the C3 Congress uh, in uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I welcome everybody to the uh, another one in the series of uh, C3 and COVID, uh, a European experience at this time. Uh, and I welcome everybody uh, who has not seen our previous uh, webinar on a Chinese experience and also the vascular catastrophes in uh, New York. I welcome everyone to uh, look at those recordings as well. But today we're uh, very privileged and uh, honored to have uh, some distinguished guests here. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. Giuseppe Tarantini, who is the president of the Italian Society of Interventional Cardiology. He's also associate professor at the University uh, Medical School in Padua uh, in uh, Italy. Also, Dr. Tiziana Claudia Aranzula, uh, a, a known uh, uh, female interventionalist uh, from Italy and also one of the co-directors of the Women in Interventional uh, Cardiology section at C3 meeting, and Dr. Rafael uh, Ramaguela from Barcelona, Spain, who also has a tremendous experience uh, with uh, COVID's uh, cardiac uh, manifestations and just written two uh, uh, seminal articles on uh, cardiac manifestations of uh, COVID, as well as the current guidelines in the Spanish uh, General Journal of Cardiology. So um, along with that, uh, my moderator will be uh, Dr. Brian Cluck uh, from uh, Lehigh Valley in Allentown, who is actually fighting COVID on the front line in uh, Lehigh Valley, probably the uh, busiest COVID uh, hospital in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, right now. So uh, lots of uh, learning is about to occur. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Tarantini, who is going to do the first uh, uh, talk uh, on Italian experience with COVID uh, implications for uh, cardiology. Giuseppe, uh, it's all yours now. Thank you, Rajideim. And now I'll try to pull up my screen. Let me see if I'm able to do that. I'm not able to share video. I don't know why I don't see my presentation. So I don't see how to put up on the screen. So at the bottom of the screen, there should be a link. Uh, uh, there should be something which says share. If you click on share, it will show your uh, computer screen to everybody. Okay, let me see if I open up my <clears throat> Can you see my slides or not? No, I see you. I don't see the slides. Uh, it takes, there is a couple seconds of delay after you hit share. No, I don't see anything. Let me, let me see if I could, okay, hold on now. It's working, yeah. Can you see now? Yep, okay. I can see perfect now. Okay, thank you. Sorry for this technical problem. No problem. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and a privilege to share with you some knowledge related to our Italian experience. <laughs> Let, let's go uh, fast forward. Okay, this is my outline. I would like to share with you the Italian COVID-19 update. I would like to share with you also some about standards and control measures to prevent and the introduction and spread of COVID-19 in the lab. What is important also to share is the difference between hospital versus community acquired COVID-19. This is very important, especially related to the characteristics of the COVID-19 throughout Italy. Then I would like to talk about in two slides about the impact of outbreak on ACS and TAR in my country and what about the non-COVID related mortality during pandemia. And it said that this is just to refresh, you know, where we are, the first ranking is for US in terms of total case, new cases and uh, new deaths. But if you look at the deaths per million people is just 77, is three, the third column to last, 76. But you know, the first ranking with this regard in terms of percentage out of a million people belong to Spain. It is close to 400 deaths per million people in the COVID and the second place is sadly, sadly met by Italy. 
it is very important to keep in mind to understand why we have why it seems that we are witnessing a reduction in the infection rate in Italy, but we are seeing a plateau in terms of mortality. As you can see here, even though there is a disconnection of three to four weeks between the infection and the mortality events. So actually with this four times lag, we have to wait two more weeks to see a reduction also in the incidence of mortality in our country. So we are pretty sure that we are seeing, you know, the end, the light of the tunnel, but we need to be prepared to be really careful to not relax too much. So let's share this point I think is important because the WHO recommendation we need to be aware about these are very generalistic because they belong to the community hospital. They are very, as, as I told you, generalistic. So we need to have at least two symptoms, fever plus cough or shortness of breath, plus epidemiological features that mean travel, contact with a confirmed or probable C19 or need for hospitalization. As you can see by this slide, we cannot take into consideration this WHO definition for the hospital because all the patients need hospitalization when they stay in the hospital. The third point is the test. We need to increase the number of tests. This is also the last release on 22nd of March 2020 20, of the WHO that says that we have to increase the test numbers for vulnerable patients healthcare workers. So in this, with this regard, when you deal with the hospital, you need to test, test, test healthcare personnel and vulnerable patients if you want to reduce the spread of this infection. Then at this point, you can label suspected case when you have, you know, symptoms plus the epidemiological aspect, but you don't have still the, the swab, you don't have the test. Probable when the test is not, has been done, but is not available the result and confirm is whatever is symptoms or not when you have a positive test. Having said that, how we change this definition, the hospital setting? I think this is very important to share. We got rid of the need of the combination of symptoms and we got rid of the epidemiological aspects because obviously all the patients are hospitalized so need to be considered as vulnerable patient and the local contact, the local transmission is everywhere. So we can get rid of that. So how do we deal with this patient? We have a huge emergent case. While waiting test result, all these patients are tested. We know very brief, very timely and quickly, and then we have to wait the result. While we wait the result, we consider this patient as a COVID positive patient. So we need, we wear the appropriate PPE and all the other things. So we pretend that the patient is a COVID positive. For electric case, we have dramatically reduced the admission to the hospital. We have pushed back until, you know, the need, the real need to face very high risk patients, or we have a situation where the patient has been tested before the admission and the test is negative. So having said that, we have, you know, produced this kind of primer just to try to help our community <clears throat> to have some guides to try to reduce the risk of introduction and spread of the COVID-19. COVID we have general management of the lab, daily checklist of the cat lab, the crash cart, what to do before the COVID arrival, procedure of donning and doffing, what to do periprocedurally and post-procedural requirements. All these things are very well standardized, has been published very recently on catheterization and cardiovascular inter intervention because we are very close with the sky societies. And so, you know, just to, because I don't have the time to go over all these aspects, but just to show in this slide that when you respect the 10 commandments, the 10 rules, that means to summarize, test every patient, especially elected patient before getting in the hospital and getting in the lab and always wear proper PPE, reduce dramatically the percentage, the spread of the COVID in the operator, in the personnel. These are two different divisions in the same department. One adopted the, the protocol and the other one not. So as you can see, the rate of infection within doctor, fellows, 
uh, patience and personal is about 13% against 1%. So having rules, protocols matter. So you need to be very prepared on that. The last three points is COVID versus community and why COVID, the impact of COVID on ACS and TAP. I think to understand this point, and this is very important for all your countries, you need to make a comparison between Germany and Italy. As you can see, the lethality rate in Germany is 1.5% against 12% in Italy. Why that? This is not because we have a different virus. I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the case by age, in Germany, the mean age is 47 years against 64 years in Italy. That means that if you look at the deaths by age, it's pretty the same. So the virus is the same. The difference is that in Germany, the source of infection has been the community and not the hospital, because at the very early beginning of the Germany, German experience, all the patients and the personnel were tested. So they isolated the spot perfectly, you know, the, even the asymptomatic care. In Italy it was different because we didn't test all the patients and the personnel, so we missed an opportunity and the source of infection were the hospital. And as a matter of fact, if you look at these two regions, Lombardia and Veneto, and Lombardia is, you know, the region of Milan, and Veneto is the region of uh, Padua Hospital. Here you can see that the rate of hospital positive, mortality rate and lethality rate, 18% against about 4%. And again, this has been related to the earlier outbreak in Lombardia, delayed isolation measurements, but also in the hospital fewer tests and less active surveillance. And again, as a matter of fact, the number of tests per million people was, were half the one that we did in Veneto because we had the experience, two weeks of experience from Lombardia that they didn't make tests. And what they did is to not create, you know, isolated, you know, world for COVID and separate the COVID free from the COVID positive. And this is a very important lesson. What about the ACS? We have witnessed a reduction in ACS, especially during the lockdown, because the people is actually afraid to get in the hospital. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the time delays, the symptom onset from first medical attention is longer, is very longer during the COVID shadow, COVID outbreak compared to the year before, but there is no delay in the hospital. Because when you have protocol in place, you won't waste time. The point is that the patients are scared. But now that we have a soft lockdown, we have a kind of surge of ACS, six per day, because the people are more confident. So you need to be prepared also to restart to normality. This is another chapter, but we don't have the time to discuss. Finally, related to the TAV procedure, what we are witnessing is a reduction that is going to depend uh, to the isolation period, the locking period, if the locking period is going to be three months, we will have about 25% 25 redu 25 reduction. But if we go, if we push back the, uh, the isolation measures and the fact that we focus our attention to emergent and urgent case, we're going to see a 50% reduction. That means that means an increase in mortality. And this is my last slide. We cannot erase the mortality related to other causes that are not COVID-19 <clears throat> related deaths. And as a matter of fact, if you look in Italy, uh, the first March, uh, the first three weeks of March in 2020, compared to the first three weeks of the previous five years, as you can see, there is an increase in delta of mortality from 54% in this decade, 65 to 74, up to 75% in older patients. That means that these patients are being undertreated. They stay at home. We do not admit this patient in the hospital. So this is another thing to face with the, within the COVID, the COVID shadow. So thank you for your attention hanging there. Thank you. I can't hear you. I think you have to unmute. I think you have to unmute, Raj. The microphone. 
the microphone. Let's do again and mute the, your microphone, Ray. Okay. Great. Thank, well, you. thank you very much. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, anybody any, have any questions? Uh, Rafa, in Spanish, you know, uh, lots of cases down there. Any questions for Giuseppe? Everything very clear. Thank you. Dr. Clark. Brian, unmute your uh, microphone, please. Otherwise, okay. So, okay. Giuseppe, that was that was a brilliant presentation. I'm I'm uh, honored to have heard it. Uh, I'm very interested in knowing: uh, uh, Are you at the point right now of uh, doing uh, urgent but non-elective cases? Pardon me, could you repeat? I, I did. I, I lost. You know the last part to your question. Yeah, uh, I'm interested. Doing, yeah, I'm interested in knowing cases or elective cases also. So what what, you, what we are going now is to to do a very soft restart. That means we are starting what we call in Italy class A. That means that we need to admit from the diagnosis within 30 days that are actually you know very symptomatic uh, valvular patients or patients with a significant angina etc so we are going to start but all the elective patients before getting admitted in the hospital they need to be tested so three days before they come uh, in the hospital not within the hospital but outside the hospital we have some booth where we test all the patient we wait for one day, two days for the result. When we have the result that is negative, they are going to be admitted to, to the division. So this is the precaution that we use so far. Great. Right. Go ahead, Brian. So what, what number or what parameter did you use to initiate the soft opening? So the parameter that we use is the monitoring of the intensive care unit. So actually we have five intensive care units with tens of beds. Now, considering that uh, it's, you know, the, during the, the, the burst of the outbreak, all the, all the beds of the intensive care unit were occupied. Now we have three intensive, three intensive care units that are empty. We have just two of them, so we get two completely empty just to be prepared in case of relapse. But we are pretty sure that we have more than half of the beds that are empty, so we can start. But Brilliant. the point is that, Brian, the point is that it's important to have different pathways between the COVID patient and non-COVID patient. You need to avoid absolutely the mix up because somebody says, we need to save time. We don't have to waste, uh, for instance, 30 minutes in a treatment. This is not the problem. The problem is that you need to protect the personnel because if you don't stay, you know, safe and healthy, you cannot keep curing still any patient more. So this is the point. I cannot agree more that uh, we need to have the utmost precaution for our health uh, care workers, including physicians, also need to test very aggressively and definitely need to have a separate COVID uh, unit for inpatient admissions and also should have a separate COVID pathway for these patients going uh, back and forth from the, uh, for any procedures as much as we can. Yes. Okay. This, is, this is another important. I'll tell you one thing because I was in completing one thing. All the emergent cases like STEMI or, uh, you know, hemodynamic, unstable, non STEMI patients, for instance, okay, or I don't know, aortic valvuloplasty, whatever it is. The point is that we test the, these patients, we do not wait for the result of the test that actually we have a very fast test that's with the result in less than 90 minutes. But so we treat this patient as a, po a COVID positive patient. Then we keep the patient in the room. In, within 90 minutes, we will have the result of the test 
if the patient is a COVID positive, we'll go straight to the intensive care unit that is a COVID positive intensive care unit and not in the CCU. This is very important because you need to be very careful to avoid again the mix up because you need to, to go too fast. You know, we can toggle one urgent case each. We don't need to hurry up. Absolutely. Now that's a great advice, you know, to send the test, wait until the result comes back before we do the disposition for the patient from the catheter. And that's a great, uh, great suggestion. Well, that's fantastic. Lots of uh, learning. Thank you, Giuseppe. We'll keep moving. Uh, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Aranzula, uh, who is going to present an Italian severe COVID case in, in female patient, uh, Dr. Aranzula. I'm ready, but I need uh, um, to have the free screen, otherwise I'm not able to share my presentation. So maybe Giuseppe, you have to leave the screen. Okay. Okay. Looks like uh, we are. Okay, good. We can see your screen now. Okay. Okay. The case I want to show you with you, what you want to show you um, is uh, the case of uh, one of my colleagues, a cardiologist colleague. And she was diagnosed uh, with COVID uh, pneumonia on the 18th of March. And uh, from that time, uh, really, we all realized how, how the disease was close to us. She started with just with weakness. She thought she was just tired because she had worked uh, hard. But then she developed headache and dry cold and worsening dyspnea. And uh, she um, underwent nasal swab, which was positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And she was admitted to the emergency department. Her vital parameters were okay. Um, she was just uh, tachycardic, but uh, just an heart rate of 90. She had no fever and saturation was 98%. Blood tests uh, showed an initial uh, elevation of liver enzymes. Her uh, C-reactive protein was high. Uh, and he had leukopenia and lymphopenia, which are um, typical features. Therefore, she was sent to do uh, the CT scan. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are ground glass lesions and uh, some areas of consolidation as typical for uh, COVID pneumonia. Therefore, she was sent to the newborn intensive care COVID ward. Wow. Very bad. Um, Immediately, um, she was prescribed antiviral therapy with the ritonavir and uh, lopinavir for uh, 100 milligrams twice a day, plus uh, hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams twice a day. And this is the, our standard initial therapy in uh, COVID patients. And um, as you can see uh, in the upper panel, there's therapy um, and uh, down there are blood tests. And uh, you can see that the C-reactive protein continued to rise. The D-dimer was high. And this is also a prognostic sign as we can see later. And also the um, uh, white blood cells and the lymphocytes uh, uh, went lower. Uh, platelets were a little bit uh, lower, but not uh, so scaring. Um, and the saturation on arrival was 88%, the first ABG. But then in two days, and at the third, um, it worsened to 49 millimeters of mercury. Therefore, uh, oxygen was administered through nasal cannulas. And uh, uh, we continue therapy 
the C-reactive protein continued to rise. And actually, there was no clinical improvement at this stage. So uh, we thought about prescribing also the tolichizumab, uh, which is uh, an antibody anti-interleukin-6. Uh, but at this stage, uh, we decide to add uh, an oxaparin, 4,000 international unit, and wait for improve. Actually, the improvement uh, where um, they truly were. Uh, and uh, um, we decide to continue our, our antiviral therapy and the hydroxychloroquine. Uh, oxygen was contained. And we rechecked for the nasal swab at the uh, ninth day, which po was still positive despite clinical improvements. Then um, we stopped with the oxygen because clinical improvements were clear, uh, even if uh, uh, with uh, little movements, desaturation still occurred. Nasal swab was performed again on day. 12 and it was negative while we mm, detect the presence of antibodies uh, immunoglo immunoglobulin G and M anti um, SARS CoV 2. The nasal swab was rechecked after 12 hours and was negative again. And she was discharged after 12 hours after the um, last uh, nasal swab. During the hospital course, main symptoms were diarrhea, up to uh, nine episodes a day, so, uh, severe cough, dry cough, um, headache, and this was the main cause for uh, um, paracetamol administration because no fever was actually present, um, and tachycardia. During uh, hospitalization, both radial arteries were dissected, uh, she was your child home in isolation, even if uh, she was still with a dry, severe dry cough. And then oxyparin, uh, 4,000, prescribed, was prescribed for seven days. Um, she, uh, due to the radial uh, bilateral dissection, she decided to double the enoxaparin dose and to continue um, for at least one or two months. On Easter day, she broke the isolation and she had uh, her first lunch with her son. And uh, today, one month after the admission, uh, I call her. She's better. Cow persists, but much less. And she's, she's, still, she's still taking an oxaparin. Um, of course, this is not the rule because if you, if, as uh, you saw, our data are very bad. But um, this case um, gives me the occasion to share with you uh, several insights and to analyze factors which were involved in the successful healing of my colleague. First, the gender. As you may be he heard, um, it has been suggested that there, are gender there could be gender discrepancies in the propensity to develop the infection. Um, but of course, these data um, are not uh, um, so precise because uh, it, they should rely on massive screening. And this is impossible because you should test the entire population not to mention the percentage of uh, uh, negative, false negative um, nasal tests uh, that could be up to 30, 40 percent, and also the fact that uh, some nasal swab uh, may become um, positive later on. And also you can see that South Korea, that is the country that uh, as the highest rate of testing shows a different trend in which females are infected more than males. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Despite this, in all the countries, the trend is the same. Uh, that's are less in the female gender, even in South Korea. 
These are data that are uh, tracked by Global Health 5050. There is an institution that is involved in the tracking of sex disaggregated data. And these are Italian data um, disaggregated by age and gender. And uh, as you can see, looking in the uh, different age groups, um, the, from the age of 20 to 49 years old, women are more infected than men, but despite this, the lethality rate is higher for all age groups in men. You can also see that uh, for the age group of more than 90 years old, uh, women are more infected, but this is because uh, the uh, rate of uh, 90 year old uh, people is higher in women. And even in this age group, the lethality rate is higher in men. And if you, if you see the overall rate, lethality rate is 15.8 in men and 8.5 in women. The overall uh, um, lethality rate is 12.2%. Which are the possible cases for the reduced mortality in women? The, immune system that could be stronger in females. Actually, the, there is uh, some uh, documented resistance to viral infections uh, in women as compared uh, with men. The hormonal status, estrogens, that may act as inflammatory and antithrombotic, and this is important as we can see later. The lower smoking habits in females, but this could be true in China, where only the 2% of women smoke, but in Italy uh, is um, not really likely that this made the difference because male smokers are 28% versus 19% of female smokers. And what we miss for sure is uh, the uh, data, sex disaggregated data indicated in how many of these cases um, there was a relative severity of the disease according to the gender. So if, um, if the difference death rate is related to difficult difference, uh, different uh, clinical severity of the disease. Other factor that uh, played a role in uh, the su successful healing was being a doctor. Um, these are data um, e examined by our uh, health institute uh, in health workers. And uh, what was uh, detected is that median age in health workers uh, with the COVID infection is 48 years old. They represent 10%, so a really high percentage of all the COVID patients, and 77% of these patients are female. That means that um, assuming uh, similar probabilities of being exposed and tested, females are more infected than men. Uh, luckily, the uh, lethality rate for um, health workers is 0.3%, so is a really lower than the general um, lethality rate. Uh, actually, at the moment, we don't have this data of mortality um, disaggregated for uh, gender, but still they are reassuring. And uh, some uh, um, possible explanation for the lower lethality rates are uh, first that uh, the tests um, are more widely performed uh, and second, as happened in our colleague, that the uh, treatment is earlier because tests is performed even when there are mild symptoms or when um, there's a, um, there was a contact with a, a suspect of the patient. And also another important factor that may play a role is the anti-inflammatory therapy before admission. Our colleague was on corticosteroids and on um, non-steroidal um, and, and non anti-inflammatory drugs before admission due to her arthritis. And it has been demonstrated that the pathogenic mechanism of the SARS-CoV-2 infection involves both the direct viral effect and the inflammatory response of the host. 
therefore, um, drugs that can mitigate excessive inflammatory response could be beneficial. And this may explain why immunosuppressive patients seem to fare better. Therefore, early anti-inflammatory treatment might be useful, on the contrary of what was initially argued. And also, as we already um, said, early admission and treatment were important. Um, there has been detected uh, three phases of the disease. And uh, as we all know, time matters in all the field of medicine. And uh, the, in the first phase, the virus replicated inside the, the cells. And if uh, the disease is blocked in this early phase, the benign is completely, um, benign, the, the course is completely benign. In the second phase of the disease, uh, there's an interplay between the uh, virus and the uh, host inflammatory response. So um, in this phase, uh, pneumonia arises and there are morphofunctional uh, um, problems on the lung, but still we can act. In the third phase, we have the cytokine storm and the host inflammatory response uh, prevails. And these uh, are the worst scenarios in which a patient can die uh, also for coagulated um, diffuse uh, um, DIC, diffuse intra, okay. And Italian task forces are evaluated protocols to deliver early home therapies, in particular hydroxychloroquine, to affect the disease as soon as possible and reduce, and reduce the rate of hospitalizations. This is one of uh, our efforts now. And uh, there's uh, another um, factor um, that uh, also helped our uh, cardiologist colleague and th there's the self-management. She decided to double the dose of enoxaparin due to the radial dissection. And the data from Italian autopsy studies that are so far the largest in the world has shown the, frequent, the frequent, frequent presence of thrombi in the uh, alveoli. And there's true that prothrombotic status secondary to cytokine storm and hyperinflammations um, enhance the um, thrombosis, and also that uh, SARS-CoV-2 binds and inhibits the endogenic heparin. For these reasons, anticoagulants have been linked with better survival, uh, and for the same reason, high D-dimer values from uh, also from the Chinese experience are predictor of favorable therapeutic response to heparin and the bad outcome if no anticoagulants are uh, prescribed. Therefore, anticoagulation may be crucial, but there are ongoing and evolving ideas. I just spoke with uh, the director of uh, one uh, hospital in Sacco, in Milan, the Sacco Hospital, and he has just developed a new protocol. Um, he is using <coughs> heparin and tyrofiban, and he administered the combination of both in a, a patient in very bad condition. This protocol is only for compassionate use, uh, but he has treated uh, five patients so far, and they uh, left a CAP-AP helmet two hours after the in infusion of a uh, pyrofiban. So uh, these are really impressive data. We will follow this data and we will, uh, this, this is a completely evolving field. Uh, what is important that uh, this uh, protocol is led by a cardiologist because he um, took this idea from the Noreflow studies and early um, STEMI experiences. So I think uh, that uh, what is important is an integrated approach. We all have to share our experience and uh, we, can be, we can win if all we give our, our contributes and be little uh, tile of a, a big puzzle. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Tiziana. That was a superb presentation. Lots of very interesting information. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you also 
uh, uh, gave a significant importance to uh, alveolar uh, microthrombotic in a venous thrombotic phenomena. We just had a discussion last week uh, with our vascular colleagues from New York where a large number of uh, patients with arterial as well as venous thrombosis and a pulmonary embolism were presented to the vascular service who are COVID-19 and now uh, a, a, a full therapeutic anticoagulation is given uh, to many of these uh, very sick patients who are immobile and undergoing a large inflammatory response. Um, uh, Dr. Cluck, uh, Dr. Ramaguera, Dr. Tarantini, and I also see Imad now, Dr. Shaiban, who is joined from Verona. Uh, anybody have any comments? My first comment is, is uh, that was a fantastic presentation really, really very informative, and I, I am uh, I'm privileged to have heard it. Thank you. Actually, I've heard the experience of uh, our vascular coll surgeon colleague, Dr. Balar, and uh, I, uh, I completely agree uh, on what he saw because uh, we have the, the same experiences and also some cardiologist colleague um, had the opportunity to see not, uh, uh, let's say, the usual occlusive thrombing coronary arteries, but uh, diffuse spreading of thrombi, like uh, it is, uh, let's call it a vasculitis um, that, um, that impose diffuse thrombosis. I can also share some experiences of, uh, of my dermatologist colleague that are um, at the moment experiencing strange cases of uh, a peripheral vasculitis that they haven't seen before. And uh, they have related uh, them with COVID, uh, even if in uh, childhood and uh, in um, people less than 15 years old, symptoms are not that clear. So it's just uh, uh, an hypothesis. Now, it's very, very interesting uh, stuff. And I think that we're going to learn more and more about you know, uh, COVID presentation in kids and, and a pediatric cardiologist is gonna get involved, you know, given some of our pediatric patients have congenital heart disease. But anyway, in the interest of time, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tiziana, that was uh, outstanding. Uh, we will now uh, continue uh, with the presume the COVID presentation to the cath lab. This is very important for interventional cardiologists, you know, that when patient arrives, uh, to the cat lab, uh, how uh, should you uh, behave and how should you uh, uh, protect yourself uh, given that we now know that 10% uh, uh, higher, 10%, almost 10% of the infection is in the healthcare workers. Uh, so we really need to uh, protect ourselves. So Dr. Imad Shaiban, uh, who is the director of cardiology at the Pedersoli Hospital in Verona, Italy uh, is going to talk about how to deal with the presumed COVID uh, presentation to the cat lab. Thank you, Raj. Uh, are you seeing my slides? I am not. I see oh. you. Yeah. Okay. I'll share you my share slides. The screen. Yeah. Okay. Success. Great. Okay. I see, it. I see it. Yeah. Good. So, <clears throat> What is uh, all we agree that today, the treatment of uh, ACS, I will focus on ACS since all Italian data have been reported uh, uh, fantastically by Tarantini and, uh, and Tiziana. So I will focus about uh, practical things, what to do with patients that suspected to have COVID. Uh, so, and uh, focusing on ACS patients. ACS uh, guidelines, we all know what, what is, and uh, what the change uh, in uh, ACS management in COVID uh, pandemia is that general strategy regarding severity of local epidemic situation and conservative treatment is preferred as follows. That means for STEMI with indication for uh, fibrinolytic uh, 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 is recommended, uh, and uh, third uh, generation of uh, thrombolytic agents are preferred uh, if this, there's no contraindication for 
uh, for thermal ISIS. Uh, acute uh, STEMI patient with uh, severe complication uh, that exceed, uh, uh, exceed the, the re revascularization time uh, should be uh, treated with uh, thrombolysis, should not be uh, going to cath lab. Patient with high risk uh, non STEMI and uh, unstable angina pectoris also should, should uh, be uh, uh, investigated. Patient with acute heart failure also should be avoided to uh, uh, as much as possible to, uh, pro to bring in uh, cath lab. Uh, optimized uh, medical treatment should be taken as much as possible uh, in uh, uh, what we are receiving, patient we are receiving. I think that uh, from practical point of view, fast screening for COVID uh, risk uh, in undeferable patients uh, by fellows, uh, consultants, doctors, cath lab nurses can be, uh, can be done uh, just by verbal communication, particularly in patients that who do not, we do not have any investigation about COVID in, uh, about this patient. We should at least invest, investigate about uh, the clinical, uh, I mean, uh, the, the history of the patient, uh, whether they have uh, confirmed, uh, confirmed, uh, investigated uh, COVID-19, uh, or does the patient have co or any symptoms, or have been in touch with any uh, with any COVID positive uh, patient, or have uh, a temperature higher than 37.5, and so on. So this initial and fast. In investigation allows us to uh, to uh, have some risk uh, 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 risk of exposure to COVID uh, COVID patient. Uh, low risk will be those are who have no symptoms and no contacts with patients. Uh, intermediate and high risk uh, uh, risk for uh, uh, COVID infection will be all the other that having some. Uh, symptoms or some history uh, coming in touch with uh, any COVID patient or have some somebody in family who is uh, suffering from COVID uh, or traveling across countries uh, with uh, COVID epidemia. Uh, so in uh, according to the to, to the, the uh, recent consensus guidelines inter interventional uh, cardiology uh, society in uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand, I think it is, uh, is a good sense uh, to uh, follow uh, this kind of uh, classification and accordingly uh, to uh, bring patient for, uh, for the uh, cat lab or not. So patient with low exposure risk of COVID can, can be brought to cat lab with uh, uh, apparently a clinic procedure applied as, as usual practice, but with full protection of operator. Uh, fibrinolytic uh, uh, therapy could be considered in uh, lytic eligible patients and high exposure or inter intermediate exposure to uh, uh, COVID risk and uh, high, exposure, uh, high exposure risk, that means highly suspected patient should only be brought into cath lab if they have symptoms and HEG change refractory to medical or fibrinolytic therapy or uh, hemodynamic instability or large STEMI, for example, with the left main involvement or proximal LID with uh, 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 a huge territory uh, with hypotension or ar uh, arrhythmia, so on high risk. Patient with the severe pneumonia uh, should not be brought to cath lab Multi, uh, multi speciality management discussion likely necessary before uh, bringing these patients in cath lab in order to uh, evaluate the escalation to intubation, hemodynamic stability, or uh, uh, support benefit of risk to benefit uh, for invasive angiography or uh, angioplasty uh, decision or to palliate in these patients. Uh, the possibility of uh, also. Uh, primary my myocardium involvement, that myocarditis should be considered and possibly excluded during uh, uh, using uh, CT and or echo is also very useful and handheld devices 
may be advantage, uh, advantages because of, uh, of uh, simple use and simple, simpler uh, cleaning. So uh, myocarditis versus, versus ACS, I think should be uh, diagnosed when it's suspected uh, in symptoms and signs, laboratory inspection, ACG, echo, chest, uh, uh, chest uh, X-ray or CT, and COVID test, of course, if, uh, if this uh, patient is, is, bring, uh, is, is uh, brought to the uh, cat lab, COVID test can be, uh, uh, can be uh, deferred after the procedure, with, particularly with STEMI patient. Uh, I think that the management uh, or consensus for management is coming also from ACC and the SKY, as well as from the Italian Society of Cardiology, as uh, Giuseppe has uh, mentioned before, and actually, again, repeating the same recommendation done by the consensus seized by the, by the Australian. That means high, only high-risk patients with hemodynamic instability should be uh, brought to the uh, cath lab for invasive treatment. Uh, if, if it is possible to investigate the patient before coming in the cath lab, it is good to investigate him. That means by COVID test, if you can uh, defer the procedure for uh, two or three days, because in my, uh, in my hospital, uh, I think we have to wait uh, two to three days in order to have the uh, response of the test, the COVID test. Uh, otherwise, in, in STEMI patient, when you do not, you cannot stay, you cannot wait, uh, particularly in high risk patient, then they should can go for cat lab, but they should be investigated after, after uh, the procedure. And of, of course, uh, the isolation of, of the patient after procedure until you do not, you are not sure whether it is confirmed or not, uh, the COVID uh, diagnosis, uh, the patient should be isolated. Uh, we, of course, uh, using uh, fibrinolytic therapy, we should, uh, take care about all these elements which contraindication of our uh, fibrinolytic therapy. Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we can have some delay in uh, STEMI care in COVID patient, which can be uh, multifactorial. The screening for COVID with the detailed travel contact history and all these things, X-ray before transferring patient to cath lab, then can increase delay in diagnosis and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the treatment. Uh, cath lab staff need time to do, uh, uh, to do a protective gear, performing all the protective maneuvers and precautions. Limited uh, emergency medical services due to sick staff or systemic, uh, uh, systemic uh, sorry. And uh, of course, uh, patients' fear of co uh, contracting uh, an infection from healthcare system uh, uh, can encourage people to wait more than what they are uh, that they will do without uh, this fear of infection. So all these elements can can uh, uh, can make the de uh, delay or can produce a significant delay in, in STEMI uh, care patients. And this is also is coming from this study done uh, on small numbers, uh, really, but it's showing uh, time from symptoms to first medical contact was longer in COVID STEMI patient for uh, like 318 minutes versus 82 minutes uh, in office hour and 91 minutes in uh, non-office hours if compared to patients uh, treated for uh, STEMI two years before in the same hospital. Longer door uh, to device time, one uh, uh, 29 minutes versus 85, 84 minutes respectively, and longer cath lab arrival to device time, 33 minutes uh, versus 20 minutes respectively. So this should be also taken consideration when you are, uh, you are evaluating patient for procedure. Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, all patients brought to the uh, cath lab, even though uh, those who are at 
low risk of exposure to COVID-19 uh, should be considered as suspected and uh, protection should be full protection level three for all cath lab staff. Patient also with cardiac emergency will take, you should take temperature, uh, wear mask, and of course protect the patient as well and uh, diminish the delays in treatment avoid nosocomial infection if you can uh, you can uh, uh, as, as much as you can you should shorten staying of the hospital in uh, uh, of the patient if, if it is not needed and of course after every procedure covid screening is very important thank you very much for your attention Imad, that was fantastic uh, uh, presentation. You know, I like to ask a couple of questions. And uh, you know, in Spain, uh, Rafa, are your STEMI patients uh, uh, getting thrombolytic therapy, or are you taking them to the cath lab? Do you have a protocol or not? Yeah, we 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 wrote a protocol, and what we recommend in Spain from the Spanish Association of Interventional Cardiology is primary PCI for all patients, for all patients as the preferred strategy. However, uh, the emergency system, uh, not right now, but probably a few weeks ago, was was overwhelmed, and we recommend thrombolysis for those patients that could not be transferred within 120 minutes, that uh, probably were somehow. 10%, 5%, but the preferred strategy for us is, regardless of the status of COVID patient, is a primary PCI. Yeah. You know, my that's biggest it. concern with uh, primary PCI, and in, that's the same thing we do uh, in US, is in accidental exposure of international cardiologists and a cardiac cath lab staff, you know, on an unknown uh, patient. The patient may have come with a ST elevation. In fact, I, I do know about a case uh, from New York where a patient presented with a chest pain, 55-year-old, ST elevation, went to the cath lab, uh, uh, compl was complaining of shortness of breath, turned out to have normal coronaries, uh, eventually was diagnosed with a COVID pneumonia uh, and turned out to be COVID positive and ended up exposing uh, almost 10 to 11 healthcare workers, uh, they all had to be uh, then quarantined for two weeks. So, you know, this is a one concern I do have that, you know, at least in a US based uh, uh, emergency response system, you know, the moment uh, a STEMI arrives in the emergency room, nobody wants to do anything with it except to just send the patient to the cath lab. And that's what worries me that somebody needs to do some type of screening. Brian, you know, what, do you, what is your uh, situation in Lehigh Valley? We are sort of in, uh, in a neighborhood of each other. Well, uh, very similar to, uh, to, you know, to what you're describing. Uh, uh, STEMIs, by and large, uh, do not get thrombolysis unless they're coming from an outside institution and there's a delay. All non-STEMIs are, uh, are triaged to medical therapy first, and only the unstable STEMIs are the ones that go to the, uh, uh, to, to the lab. Um, and it, we, we've found that, uh, that our non-invasive colleagues are all too happy to, uh, to triage those patients to initial medical therapy, and that's not been much of a problem. We were very, very happy to have uh, Dr. Tarantini uh, uh, previously describe his donning and doffing, which we've adopted wholesale and it's really been very, very effective. So I want to thank him personally for that. That video has helped us tremendously. Yeah, and, and um, I, I'm going to have Rafa talk about more about this in a, in a minute. However, you know, we, I just recommended it to our cat lab yesterday that uh, now on call, when for, I'm talking about emergency in non-business hours, that there will be a donning and doffing specialist available on the cath lab for yeah. an undiagnosed STEMI case. So I agree. international cardiologists Absolutely. are not used to putting on this type of protective gear, they make mistakes all the time. So I've recommended that a, a specific person who is trained in this is going to come in, you know, and get, you know, uh, healthcare uh, workers as well as physician, help them don before they do a case where COVID-19 uh, 
in the presumed diagnosis. I totally agree with you, Rash. The, uh, for a cardiologist, an interventional cardiologist is really compl complex to to uh, to go to dress and, and and dress. And even if you have the instructions, you are not used to. So it's it's very complex unless you have uh, some 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 cases. And myself, I wrote the the protocol, and then the first case I did, I said, well, this is really complex. I just wrote it, and even with that, it's very complex for me. And regarding the previous thing that you said, uh, I fully agree because if you have a positive uh, COVID patient with mechanical ventilation, you have full protection, and the compl the risk is not that high. The the problem is for the patients that are undiagnosed. But you can have protection for the COVID patient, but then, but then what about the other patients? And then you go out of the lab and then the nurse probably can be or your colleague and then or yourself, you can touch the computer. So it's very complex. We can share our experience on this because um, at the very beginning, what we did is uh, have a nurse who was reading step by step all the donning and doffing uh, procedure. And this helped a lot. Second, we considered uh, all the patients, all the STEMI patients, as COVID a priori, without uh, any other need. Then we assess them later, but we consider them as COVID. And this enhances um, our protection. And the third is um, um, an idea that I want to share with you. In Italy, in Milan especially, we found a 20% rate of uh, normal coronary arteries in STEMI patients. So um, if you administer thrombolysis to these patients, you harm them. So um, there's something to be thought about because uh, I don't, uh, I'm not really sure that this will protect uh, uh, the patient. Maybe uh, the operators, but uh, at what price? And also, we know that thrombolysis is not 100% effective, so we can see that these patients later on the cath lab, maybe with complications. So, Tiziana, that's a great, uh, uh, great uh, uh, observation that, uh, you know, we have patients who are getting a thrombolytic therapy who uh, may have normal coronary arteries and they may have myocarditis and we may be putting them at a hemorrhagic risk of conversion to hemorrhagic pericarditis. So what I've suggested, in, at least in local, in our hospital, that, that when there is a doubt about the STEMI is to do a coronary CTA uh, yeah. to see you know, whether uh, uh, there is coronary obstruction. And this might be a great use of a uh, coronary CT and geography to prevent exposure to a uh, many cath lab personnel. But that can mean uh, delay again, uh, if the patient is, has not normal coronary artery, but has obstructive disease. So right. I, I, think, I think that uh, on geography, if you have STEMI, should be done anyway, uh, whatever. Uh, I think also the other factor that uh, contraindicating the use of uh, Litex is the age of these patients, mostly more than 80. I mean, mostly elder pe elderly people. And of course that increase more and more the stroke risk and bleeding risk also in these patients. So I think as much as you can avoid thrombolytic, uh, that's what we uh, have done also in uh, our cath lab. We consider all patients as COVID positive. We investigate them later. If they're positive, they will go for COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, hospital. If not, they will stay with us in, in cardiology. Uh, and I think that's the right way to do today, particularly in uh, severe local in the uh, infection uh, epidemia i think for us the issue has been to just make sure that the uh the ed and the first responding in hospital uh, physicians don't simply take someone with any kind of symptoms whatsoever and simply transport them to the cath lab in order to be expeditious in this day and age, and with all of these things that everybody so eloquently said, 
We just need to take a little bit more time to spend a little bit more time clinically deciding uh, who is going to be the highest chance of having coronary obstruction, ruptured plaque before we take them to the lab. Okay. Well, uh, let's uh, uh, continue now uh, with our Spanish experience. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rafael Ramaguera uh, uh, from uh, Spain. Uh, he will discuss uh, Spanish experience with the COVID in uh, cardiology. And he will also uh, share with us, uh, and I will share with you the link to uh, two very important articles that he has just published in a Spanish journal uh, uh, describing the cardiac manifestations of COVID as well as the current protocol. So Rafa, thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule. And uh, now please uh, uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Raj. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Let me share my screen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see fine. Yes, we so, as Dr. Tantini just said, uh, in Spain we have the sad honor of being the second country with the highest number of diagnosed COVID patients, the third country with the highest uh, rate of death, and the first with the highest rate of death uh, by million uh, people. And in Spain, the things uh, start to be very, very, very sat in the early part of March. And then in 14 of March, uh, the Spanish government issued uh, a decree stating the, the state of alarm in Spain with a very severe lockdown that have reduced the, mo the mobility of people in Spain by 90%. I think it's one of the highest in, in the world. And we reached the peak of, of contagions in, in March 25. So now the things in Spain are getting a little bit better. And when the things start to be, to be uh, very, very ugly, uh, the first thing that we have to learn uh, was how to dress and undress ourselves. We uh, interventional cardiologists and uh, cardiologist staff in general, we are not used to, to dress with, with this amount of protection. It was very complex. And by the day that I was writing, uh, writing this paper in March uh, 13, I was already positive in COVID, uh, in COVID uh, infection. So I was writing this, writing this paper with, with, with fever. Um, the most uh, complex part of, of, of dressing and undressing, I think, is, is to, to undress, to remove everything at the appropriate time and uh, to, to avoid touching yourself with, with uh, any part that can be contaminated. Then the old, uh, we have uh, in, in, in our hospital 34 uh, beds of ICU and 28 of coronary care unit. And by this time, we have 110 patients admitted in, a, in a, the expansion of the ICU. And the totality of coronary care unit uh, was, was with patients with COVID uh, admitted. The whole uh, staff uh, cardiology, uh, were treating COVID and uh, we had to learn how to treat these patients and how to protect ourselves. Then we have to decide what to do with our patients. Uh, the first thing that we decided that we wrote in, in this second uh, manuscript was to postpone all the elective cases and all the structural procedures uh, to try to treat conservatively the low risk acute coronary syndromes. And for the STEMI patients, we recommended a very simplified algorithm, much simpler than uh, other countries, that was to try to treat everyone with primary PCI, unless uh, we could not ensure uh, a rapid transfer with, with, within 120 minutes. Then uh, we saw that we were uh, decreasing the number of primary PCI. And we asked the data for all the centers in Spain more than 70 centers. And we saw that in the middle of the slide, there was a reduction of 40% in the, in the number of primary PCI. So we take a look in the Catalonia registry. In Catalonia, we are 10 centers performing primary PCI for a total population of 8 million people. 
And we saw that compared to the previous year and also to the early March, we saw a reduction of around 30% of primary PCI procedures in this, in this time of a significant. We also took, took a look to the, to the system delay and to the patient delay. And we saw that the system delay was very similar to, to, other, to early March and also to the previous year. Was, was, very, was, was a good time, even with the uh, emergency system transfer was uh, very overwhelmed. But the problem was for, uh, for the patient delay. We, we, we moved from 80 minutes of patient delay to more than 100 uh, minutes. Now we are taking a look to the mortality and uh, I think we have a bias here because if you took a look to the mortality of patients coming to primary PCI during the COVID period, probably is not that different to the previous time because we have a selection there. The people that is coming, they are the, the survivors, the STEMI survivors. And probably the patients that, we, that they had a ventricular fibrillation or a cardiogenic shock, and they stay at home, they died, and we don't have it diagnosed right now. So we will have to wait a few weeks or a few months to study the mortality uh, in Catalonia or in Spain uh, during the whole time. Because if you take a look just to the STEMI patients, as I said, I think the ones that came to the lab are the survivors. And I want to focus uh, as well to a case like this. The primary PCIs that we are looking, they have a huge amount of thrombus. We have seen, uh, as, you, uh, as uh, the, this you said before, uh, there is an aberrant coagulation. And uh, because of the destruction of the endothelial cells of the lung, we have a decrease in the trom self-thrombolytic system, an increase in the interleukins, increase in, in thrombin. And at the very end, what we have is an increase in fibrin, fibrin formation. And I think for this reason, we have a lot of, a lot of thrombotic uh, events in the coronaries. Uh, patients that they don't have coronary stenosis before, and we see purely thrombotic lesions. And in this case, this is a primary PCI. As you can see in the middle, was a very complex PCI, which has a huge amount of thrombus. And the final result was uh, OK, with, with residual thrombus at the, at the distal RCA, but OK. Because of this, we left this patient uh, with uh, ticagrelor, aspirin, and tyrofiban. And four hours later, uh, after the, the tyrofiban was stopped, uh, the patient had a stent thrombosis. And on the right side, you can see the final result, which I see, I think is, is very, very bad final result. But it was completely full of thrombus. We tried to perform thrombus aspiration several times. We reinitiated tyrofiban. We performed balloon dilation all over the, the artery, and the result was, was really bad. And because of this patient and another one, we asked to nine centers in Spain to report their uh, acute thrombosis rate during this time. And we saw that seven out of the nine centers have got uh, stent, acute stent thrombosis. Uh, in two cases, in two centers, they had two acute stent thrombosis. Most of the cases, uh, the stent thrombosis occur uh, in the setting of the, of the ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Most of them were treated before the stent thrombosis with ticagrelor and tyrofiban, and uh, most of them had a, a confirmed or suspect uh, COVID infection. The results of the, the, the outcomes of the patient were really, really bad with one case of shock, uh, two cases of exitus at the CAT lab, and uh, many other complications. And another complication that we are seeing in, in Spain is uh, the problem of delaying elective procedures, especially uh, uh, structural procedures. And as you can see here, this is a patient that I saw this morning in, in our hospital. On the left side, you can see the baseline echocardiography. He was a 80 years old male without any other uh, diseases. We were considering TAVI versus uh, surgical aortic valve replacement, and the, the gradients were above, uh, above 40. Uh, during this month, he was admitted again uh, due to heart failure, and because we were at the peak of the COVID infections, we decided to postpone the procedure, discharge the patient, and consider TAVI within two weeks. But uh, yesterday, he was admitted again with 27% LV ejection fraction. 
and low gradients. So this is another consequence that we are seeing during this time. Uh, we are not performing structural procedures, we are delaying um, elective procedures and we are looking uh, a reduction of STEMI patients. So we will have to take a look in our population uh, to what happened during this time during the, the during the COVID procedure and uh, during the COVID time. And that's all I, I wanted to share. Uh, first, the complexity of dressing for a cardiologist during this time. Second, the complexity of learning COVID patients during this time. Third, because we don't have ICU uh, beds uh, that are free of COVID patients, we are delaying many elective procedures and these patients might have uh, also cardiovascular mortality. And fourth, uh, we have to, to call uh, all our population to come to our emergency rooms if they have chest pain, because otherwise they may, they may have a, a problem with, with STEMI staying at home. And finally, um, be careful with STEMI patients with COVID, uh, with COVID infections with a huge amount of thrombus because they may have an acute or subacute stent thrombosis. And that's all. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Rafa. Uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, very interesting uh, 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 insight into uh, stent thrombosis in COVID patients. You know, I, I totally agree with you that uh, we definitely do have a significant problem in determining uh, uh, who is really elective versus who is urgent versus who is emergent. And uh, at least in our hospital, when uh, this whole thing started, you know, we were really put under a lot of uh, pressure to not perform any elective uh, procedures whatsoever. However, uh, you know, the patients with the severe aortic stenosis, especially who are symptomatic, uh, you know, they're not really that elective. You know, so it is a problem. Uh, in fact, uh, we're doing a webinar uh, on 25th of April at eight o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, where Dr. Pinak Shah is going to discuss uh, uh, the, the consensus of American societies on uh, TAVAR procedures uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so I think that will be a very interesting uh, discussion about who uh, the societies feel are not uh, so elective and uh, should be uh, uh, done immediately. Uh, I don't, you know, obviously if the hospital is full of COVID and there's no beds, uh, that's a problem. Uh, and it's hard to uh, fix that, you know, however, at least in our area where we do have COVID patients, but uh, we're not overrun uh, such as New York uh, or New Jersey. Uh, and we could uh, uh, provide uh, some treatment to uh, some, uh, you, you, what we want to call them urgent or emergent cases. Uh, Brian, what is your uh, hospital's uh, uh, strategy right now in, in Allentown? Raj, right now we're on complete delay for all TAVR patients. And I must tell you that, uh, you know, it's very, very concerning. I have, I have several patients that I see in the office and they're waiting for TAVR. At one, person, one point, I had a patient that's been a, a patient of mine for almost 20 years. She has severe aortic stenosis. And she called me and said, I want to be done. I don't really care about, TAV, about COVID. I want, to be, I want to be treated. And so she's first on the list. But quite frankly, my friend, you're a little west. Your COVID exposure is a little bit less than mine. And I have to call her later today. And if she is worse, she's going to make a trip to Harrisburg to be done as soon as possible because I, you know some of these patients can't wait. I'd be happy to help her out. Uh, uh, I see that uh, I can see Tiziana now. Uh, yeah. Looks like her camera is working. You know, and uh, you know what is the protocol in Milan, Tiziana, about uh, uh, Tavar? Yeah, we also stopped all the TAVI procedure, unfortunately. But uh, for um, urgent patients, uh, we, we left uh, an access. So patients that were uh, with uh, low ejection fraction, very high gradients, we, we still treat them with all the precautions, so having uh, tested them for COVID before, and we do all the necessary to have uh, the lowest risk for uh, our, for us interventionalist uh, uh, cardiologists. 
However, the, the list is long, so many patients that are now waiting um, will be, we represent a problem uh, after this uh, COVID uh, pandemia because um, we will face uh, um, many, many problems that we already face in the beginning, in the early phases of the TAVI program, but now that everything uh, has been stopped, we will face lots of patients, uh, even in shock, even coming uh, for, for uh, bad consequences. And also, another problem that uh, I, I don't know how to solve is the um, relatives problem, because they are writing lots of emails asking when, why, how, and we don't have answers, because uh, we are in the mid, between offering them protections and uh, still offering the high standards that we were used to, to offer these patients. So there's a, there's a problem actually for all of us, I guess. Um, Rafa, uh, Dr. Hari Abu Hantash is on the line. He's uh, one of the eminent uh, interventional cardiologists in Jordan. And he is asking about, uh, are you seeing more STEMI late presenters with or without uh, mechanical complications? No, we actually haven't, but uh, I'm sure we will. We actually haven't because these patients just stay at home. And uh, maybe they, they have uh, mixed symptoms. L let's think about uh, uh, shortness of breath. In this period means everything and nothing. So I know that many patients um, have called uh, our emergency system referring a shortness of breath and they were recommended to stay at home. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there is the same thing that we are seeing in US that the number of uh, uh, STEMI and acute coronary syndrome patients have uh, substantially reduced. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been an uh, enlightening uh, session. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, all the faculty, uh, Dr. Tarantini, uh, Dr. Anzula, Dr. Shaiban, Dr. Amaguera, uh, Dr. Cluck. Uh, uh, it's a, a Friday. Uh, I, I know everyone's very busy at the moment uh, with one or the other uh, uh, duties you all have. Uh, so I thank you all for uh, taking a very valuable time from your busy schedule uh, to do this session. I think it's extremely helpful uh, uh, in um, uh, understanding our role in the midst of this COVID outbreak. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, any final comments from any panelists before we close the session? I, I would just make... The one comment I would make, uh, fantastic presentation, Rafael. Um, uh, I, I think your uh, case of the right coronary artery to me um, emphasizes the importance of minimizing the amount of hardware that you put into the right coronary artery. And I wonder if you might uh, consider the possibility of Kangrelor in that case. In this case, the patient was pretreated with with Ticagrelor. Uh, I don't remember exactly the how many before, and uh, we didn't consider for these patients Cangrelor. We use it for the patients that are not in P two Y twelve when they come to the cath lab. For example, those who are on mechanical ventilation or have uh, any problem. But in this case, we prefer to be three A. That's what we did. We, we administer the bolus of thyrofiban and then the perfusion. And, but I don't know if for these cases, uh, it will be better uh, low weight uh, molecular heparin uh, for a few days after the, after the STEMI. Because uh, it's a problem of fibrin uh, formation. It's not a platelet uh, problem. It's, uh, of course, you have hyperactivation of the platelets, but I think the main issue is the fibrin. Right. Yeah, in the old days, the brand, you know, when Clearway catheter used to be available, you know, in a late presentation of STEMI, if you have a, such a large amount of thr thrombus burden, we would insert a Clearway catheter and we would inject intracoronary thrombolytics. Uh, right. uh, and, and that would be another alternative. And also the 2B3 inhibitors can be injected intracoronary as well. But, you know, obviously, 
this is now an old disease has become new one. You know, we used to see this a decade ago where we used to have late presentation is STEMI and with the uh, uh, education of the general population, we don't see that that much, you know, but now we're gonna see them again. Now, when I travel to India and treat patients in India, I see them again, you know, more often and where we use more mechanical thrombectomy devices to, you know, establish flow in this very heavily thrombotic uh, vessels. But, exactly. you know, but it could be proposed also uh, the use of intracoronary small dose thrombolytic. Yeah. Uh, since you are using radial approach, I think bleeding is not a problem. And I think that intracoronary um, thrombolytic, small dose with intra, uh, uh, intracoronary thrombolytic can be very effective. Yes. I you said, Rash, I'm not sure if, if it's the high performance of fibrin in COVID or is the late presentation or the highest uh, percentage of STEMI patients with our PCIs right now. But putting all together, all the three factors, the true thing is that we have a lot of thrombus in our coronary arteries. You have to take care and take a look because the, the rate of acute acute thrombosis might increase. In these nine centers, we found a 2.9 rate of acute acid thrombosis, mm. which is really, really high. Wow. For the examination, for example, was, was less than 1%. I think that it was 0.7% for the examination trial. Mm. Yeah. But as I said, you have 50 more or 60 more minutes of patient delay, and then you are only performing STEMI patients. So it's a complex scenario. Yeah, that is one of the major problems that the patients are coming late to the hospital. One more can... question from the audience. Coming to the hospital is around. Hi, Imad, I lost you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Rafa, uh, one more question uh, from the audience is regarding the use of ACE inhibitor uh, in um, uh, patients with LV dysfunction. We have uh, continued using them as according to the ISC, ESC recommendations, and I think that all patients should should continue with the with the with the same cardiovascular treatments in this sense. Now there is you know SARS-CoV-2 virus you know does have an impact on the ACE receptor, uh, and there is some conflicting data regarding use of uh, losartan. Uh, in these patients, whether it's protective or whether it may be harmful. Do you have any feeling one way or the other, uh, whether would you start somebody on losartan who may have LV dysfunction with a COVID or ACE inhibitor? The problem is that we, with the drugs, we are dealing with a very, very, very uh, low and bad uh, scientific evidence. And we are yeah. treating patients with drugs that we are not sure if they are good, they are harming, and we are removing cardiovascular drugs uh, because of, uh, so I think we, you should stay and what we know is, and this is that AC inhibitors are, are really effective and save lives in our cardiovascular patients, especially with LV dysfunction. Okay, so the jury is still out. Well, uh, with this, uh, I conclude uh, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, once again. Uh, have a wonderful evening in uh, Europe. Uh, I uh, uh, greatly uh, respect your uh, service to your countries. And uh, I pray uh, to God that uh, all of our European colleagues who are working in the middle of a COVID pandemic there uh, remain safe. Uh, you have all have a wonderful health. And we look forward to seeing you at the C3 meeting next year in uh, Orlando. Thank you very much. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Stay safe. Goodbye, everybody. Take Bye. Care.